living la vida loca. This show is changing lives. We talking about your diet, trying to get you feeling right. Cut up them avocados, fry some eggs. Time to explore the longest running health podcast, hosted by Jimmy Moore. Time to give up the crappy garbage. We're getting into ketosis. Every day is a new step to your goal. Yeah, you're getting closer. Motivated and focused. Don't stop, just go. Time to get inspiration from the living la vida low carb show. Hey. The Living Low Carb Show.com. Hi, is this right Ooh. here? That right there. Nate Clipfell, Fellowship of the Nate. I like the way you use a little play on words with your yeah. with your name. I tried to do that one time and it I did they just fail miserably. There's nothing wrong with Jimmy, I guess. But anyway, Fellowship of the Nate. He is a, a fitness expert. If you look at his Instagram page, you'll see that he's a power lifter. He he's obsessed, at least in his uh <laughs> at least in your bio, you're obsessed with booties. Um, there's lots of booty, um, booty workouts, booty food, booty good. He's 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 bootylicious. I think Beyonce would like you. <laughs> but you're also a nutritionist, and you're one of the ones that reached out to me recently um, when I put out the call. Hey, I want to come on my podcast. Be interesting is all I said. And so you're like, all right, how about uh, I see a lot of clients dealing with mental health issues that are tied back to addiction, which are tied back to the food. And I'm like, brilliant. Let's talk about that. So Nate, welcome to the show, my brother. Thank you so much for having me on, Jimmy. It's uh, really an honor. And uh, I apologize if I if I stutter a bit. It's kind of a uh, little uh, bit of a fanboy moment for me because I've, I've been following your work for a long time. So it's all it's good. Very cool. It's all good. Bro. Yeah. Look, we're all human beings. We put pants on one leg at a time. And uh, yeah, so just have fun with this today. And guys, so Nate is one of those people that, yeah, when you meet him, you kind of go, oh, life's all figured out. No problems whatsoever. And yet, Nate, I, I want you to articulate because you yourself have issues and you see it in your clients all the time. And then that impacts how you think about these things. Let's let's hear your story a little bit. How did you get into nutrition? And were you dealing with addiction? And were you dealing with some mental health issues prior to shifting your nutrition, which I assume is kind of a keto carnivore approach? Oh, yeah. I I, I dealt with uh, a lot of issues, my, my whole life mental health issues. That is um, stuff that I assumed was part of, you know, just normal growing up. I didn't really talk much about it. Um, and then, you know, my, my brother had, uh, some mental health issues as well. And so it's a, it's, it's been kind of a, it had been a kind of revolving theme in my family. Um, I didn't for the longest time have any connection to nutrition or have any idea that the two were even remotely related. I just assumed, you know, clearly there's something with me. Um, I'm, you know, insecure, depressed. I had troubles with my masculinity. I had yeah. all different kinds of issues growing up and, um, and they didn't seem to really get better, uh, as, as I got older, despite the fact that I always tried to stay very healthy. I started working out when I was 15, uh, 15 16. Um, and, uh, and my mom did a phenomenal job of trying to encourage me to pursue my health. Um, but I, uh, I, I was misdirected as to what health was as most of us were, um, as to the whole, you know, food pyramid, lots of fruits and vegetables and whole grains and, and whatnot. So in college, I found myself really trying to focus more on my health and I didn't have the right information yet. So I started doing the store-bought healthy choice meals and the low fat and, the, the same same thing that we've all struggled with. I know I read I read your books, so I know that that you dealt with that same thing. Um, and the most frustrating thing, which a lot of people will count me lucky for, but I, I don't know if that's the case, was that I was never um, I was never overweight. Uh, I was always a healthy weight. I always worked out, and I always looked like I was healthy and in shape. Um, and that's what made it even more frustrating because no one ever thought to look at what I was actually eating or even tried to associate those things with my health or my mental health. It was just, okay, well, clearly there's something wrong neurologically. 
um, and you need to be on some sort of medications or others. Isn't that, um, that, isn't that amazing, Nate, that the stigma in our society is to look at the fat kids, for example, and say, oh, they're the ones that are unhealthy and they're the ones that need the help and intensive help. But you bring up such a good point. You've never had a weight problem. And yet, obviously, there was underlying issues that were impacted by your nutrition and your lifestyle choices that made you highly at risk for some of the mental health things that you're talking about, but even like autoimmune diseases, other things could be possible there. Wouldn't it be cool that instead of judging based on weight, which weight's a good marker, I suppose, but you could be overweight and healthy and underweight or normal weight and very unhealthy. Why don't we test blood sugar? How cool would that be if we could test like, at a moment in time, fasting blood sugar, and then you could kind of catch things long before they start. Yeah, um, yeah, that really would be nice if, if some, somebody had told me that early on, maybe in high school at least. Um, I, the, the only thing that actually got me shifting uh, in the other direction finally was I was really fortunate that um, I had a phenomenal doctor who was definitely ahead of his time back in 2013. And he saw that I had elevated liver enzymes. And he was thinking, well, that's strange. You're in great shape. Why do you have elevated liver enzymes? Um, and he was the one who first turned me on to keto. And he said, let's try this out. See if that helps lower your liver enzymes and just kind of go from there. And so he gave me a, a handout of you know keto foods. It was it, uh, back then it was probably it was probably close to like a whole foods atkins i i would that, say uh that was the didn't, didn't help. here i was writing keto clarity and there was scant mm -hmm. anything out there i remember dr westman had his page four list of foods and it was like a, a little pamphlet thing that he had for his patients i don't know who your doctor is or if there's somebody i would know but the fact they even knew about low carb nutrition for elevated liver enzymes that that's a very educated doctor you had there i was really lucky dr dr michael franco in uh in la uh I haven't heard of him brilliant yeah he's he's a brilliant guy really really great guy um both he and his and his partner are, are wonderful people um but yeah so he was the one who got me started on it and um and I actually had a, I, I think I mentioned this to you, I had a seizure disorder as well um, that had started around, uh, I, I started having auras around sixth grade and then I had an actual grand mall in 2010 that uh, almost killed me. Um, and, and, and after that 2010 grand mall was when they finally started putting me on, trying me out on all different kinds of medications, Depakote, Keppra, Lamictal, uh, and, and then, I was also having mental health issues at that time. Yeah. Um, in fact, I became uh, clinically psychotic at one point, wow. um, which was the scariest and most horrible, horrifying experience of my life that I would never wish upon another person. Uh, but I'm very glad that it happened now because it allowed me to have such a just better lease on life <laughs> that now I can really appreciate, wow, having your sanity is truly a gift. Well, um, and in hindsight, uh, the doctor in 2013 that told you to go on a ketogenic diet for some of the mental health things, indirectly it was also helping with the epilepsy. Did he know about the, obviously he had to, he knows your medical records, but knew about the epilepsy. Yes. So he kind of knew probably between the epilepsy and maybe the related kind of side effects of some of that is some of this mental health stuff all related to your nutrition? Keto just made sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he didn't explicitly talk about the epilepsy because I, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm sure he knew about it. He just didn't, didn't explicitly say it, but I, I'm sure he kind of figured, well, if I, if I passively suggest this so he doesn't get freaked out by eating a whole bunch of fat when he's been low fat all this time, maybe, maybe he'll actually do it. Well, <laughs> um, or, ep yeah. or epilepsy than just about anything when it comes to a ketogenic diet. It's the oldest use of it, 1920. 
was when they first discovered ketones and they were using it for epilepsy control. They didn't even know like really what a beta hydroxybutyrate was. They just knew there was these bodies in your body that could be used as an alternative fuel source that would replace glucose. And so you cut the glucose in your diet and it takes over. Um, well, good, good that you had that. So tell, tell us your experience being on keto. Um, so two months uh, after, so after he gave me that diet, um, a friend of mine and I committed to, okay, two straight months, we're going to really commit to this less than 30 grams total, car total carbohydrate a day. Um, and we didn't really, we didn't really limit anything else. Uh, we just focused. I mean, I, I was, I was also bodybuilding at the time. Um, and so I still had it in my head, the whole eat, eat every two hours, you have to make sure to get all your protein in immediately after your workout and lots of protein shakes, et cetera, et cetera. And were um, so it wasn't even that too. What's that? Were you still in the mindset where, the carbs were needed to spike the insulin so that you could grow the muscle. Did you still have some of that belief system too? Fortunately, no. Oh. Uh, I had, um, yeah, I was, I was lucky that I wasn't worried about that because I was more concerned about just trying to follow the diet. Yeah. What I was worried about though was, um, was, was the fat, of course, just like a lot, everyone always does. A lot of personal trainer people, they push back at me. They're like, Hey bro, you can't, you can't grow muscle unless you spike that insulin to help target that growth of the muscle. And I'm going, okay, but gluconeogenesis can take care of some of that through the protein and the fats that you eat. So it's, it's kind of interesting the way that, that they get to, you have to have carbs, you have to eat every couple of hours. It's all based on pseudoscience, I would say. I mean, there's some science-ish stuff around that, but they act like that's the only way you can produce those results. Real Good Foods is one of the fastest growing frozen food companies in the U.S. Everything they make is nutrient dense, high in protein, low in carbs, and made from real food ingredients. They make food for every occasion, breakfast sandwiches, poppers, enchiladas, entrees, and pizza. So whether you're on a keto diet, trying to cut back on your carbs, or just trying to eat healthier, they make super convenient and tasty options. RealGoodFoods.com and at RealGoodFoods on social media. Yeah, so that's actually something I, uh, I I'm I'm a little bit of an obstinate <laughs> obstinate person at times. So I like to when, when people say those sort of hardline dogmatic ideas, I like to disprove it. So actually, my second powerlifting competition ever, um, the eight week period leading up to it, um, I ate three meals per week. So I ate one meal a day. Uh, I think it was. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Wow. Um, and then the other days I ate absolutely nothing. I completely fasted. So it was like a 40, a rolling, rolling 48 hour, yes. rolling 72 hour fasts. Um, well, and, and the funny thing about that is because of the fasting, you got growth hormone production from that because when you don't eat at all, it's better than eating every two hours. If you had the same number of calories in the whole week as you ate in those three days, and you ate it like every two hours, just a little bit every two hours, you would never have gotten that growth hormone. But the fact that you allowed your body to get into that fasted state, you got the growth hormone benefits and what happened with the competition. And I added in that eight week period, I added 40 pounds to all of my lifts. And uh, for powerlifting, you do bench uh, squat, bench press and deadlift. Um, and if, if anyone, anyone on here knows anything about powerlifting, adding 40 pounds to your lifts in powerlifting in eight weeks is, is pretty much unheard of, especially for someone who's already been training for more than 10 years. It's like basically thought to be impossible. Um, so I ended up uh, breaking all the, all the state records for my weight class and category uh, in that first competition. Sorry, it was my second competition. And going into the competition, I was already about 24 hours fasted. And by the end of it, it was about a 12 hour competition. So I was 36 hours fasted going into the deadlift, with the, which is the most challenging lift, which they say, oh, you've got to carve up for that. You've got to load up on your donuts and your gummy bears. And everybody in the competition was doing that. And I just had my water 
and, and then I broke all my records. That's interesting because those are very glycolytically demanding workouts. And so in that word glycolytically is glycogen, glucose, you need kind of that. So just tell us the biophysiology there. How did you fuel your competition? So this was at a time when I was still, I still have some crazy, pretty crazy work hours. Um, I, I, I was not optimized in other ways. I, I did really well with my diet and with fasting and all that, but I was working 16, 19 hour days, wow. six, seven days a week. And yeah. And, um, and that's part of, that's part of why I was eating uh, three meals a week was because those are my only opportunities to eat really. Um, but I, so, so I did have, to, not have to, I chose to uh, rely on caffeine at times. Um, so for that competition, I did have a little bit of caffeine. I think I had maybe uh, 200. I, I had like 100 milligrams of caffeine at the start of the competition and then another 100 uh, probably midway through what, or so. But that was... Coffee, energy drinks, what did you... Or just pure caffeine? Oh, uh, it was uh, the... What, what's the brand? Uh, Optimum Nutrition's uh, Essential Amino Energy. Oh, yeah. Because that was the only one. Yeah, yeah it's a pre-workout thing. Um, yeah, and it does it does also have amino acids right. in that, so I should, I should state that. That may have helped slightly. Uh, but, yeah, that was the only one that I'd ever used that didn't give me that. I, I always hated the beta alanine and niacin flush where you feel like you have ants crawling all over your body. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, I, I just liked kind of a more even, calm uh, energy burst, uh, which now, by the way, I, uh, I've done more competitions, broken those records again, and used no caffeine whatsoever. I, I swore off caffeine uh, almost a year ago now, I think. So, so you're all in on nu nutrition, on fasting, on obviously exercise. Uh, you are a personal trainer. And obviously, you help clients all the time. Tell me what happened as you started seeing clients, you started seeing this pattern of their nutrition being off, their addictive properties of sugar and refined carbohydrates being there, and that it leading to mental health issues. When did this connection start to become obvious? So I started as a trainer in 2013. Um, that was, well, I... I I kind of started training people in college, but it, I wasn't certified. I was just kind of working with some friends here and there. Um, I, so I officially got certified and started working as a trainer in corporate gyms in uh, 2013. And of course, I was at the time still new to keto and uh, worried about making any recommendations or overstepping my grounds because I also I wasn't a nutritionist yet. And they told us to be careful about making dietary recommendations yeah. and you're not supposed to do that unless you have, you know, the formal education in it. Oh, at uh, this gym down the road, when I first hired a personal trainer, this was many years ago, like 10 years ago. The first thing he said, was, what you eating, man? And I was already like low carb paleo keto. And he was like, man, that's going to kill you in the gym. If you don't eat your carbs, you're not going to have any energy. And I'm just like, ugh. What's, yeah. what's your nutrition background? Oh, I'm a certified trainer. Okay, and that doesn't yeah. tell me what nutrition background you have. <laughs> as, as someone who's been a trainer for, for many years now, uh, I unfortunately can tell you the process of certification is not exactly rigorous. You can go online and get, yeah, get, I have take, a, take a hundred question multiple choice quiz that you can take as many times as you want, pay a hundred bucks, and then you're a certified I trainer. I a friend. <laughs> Uh, who used to be on this podcast, Joseph Brandenburg. He's a personal trainer out of the D.C. area. And one time he signed up his dog to become a personal trainer. To <laughs> so he's got this nice certificate that's got the name of his dog as a certified personal trainer. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was the I'll thing. prove a point. <laughs> made a point. They made a big point. So, um, Anyway, yeah, I, I, so I, I started off um, just kind of going by the book or what they tell you the book is, uh, um, and 
I was noticing, I got very frustrated very quickly as a trainer, partly because I had clients who were, uh, they, they all loved me. They, they loved working with me. They were very happy. And some of them, you know, had some progress, but all I could think was why are none of these people really having the transformation that they should be? You know, they, like I, I do this stuff. I do these workouts. I challenge myself and, and it works for me. Why is it not working for them? And I hadn't quite made the connection yet until I started doing a little bit more research into it and then slowly, um, educating myself more on nutrition, uh, not just, uh, not just by getting certified, of course, but also by, well, actually one of the first, uh, first things that got me really, really deep into the science aspect of it was watching uh, one of your low carb down under um, symposium talks, uh, where you first, you were the one who introduced me to Ansel Keys and uh, the Darth Vader of, <laughs> of, uh, yes. of nutrition. Yeah. Um, Dude, that was so. That was like eight years ago, maybe nine. Twenty twelve yeah. was the first year I went to Australia. Then I went back in twenty fourteen, and then again twenty sixteen. So it probably was that twenty twelve one you saw. Yeah, yeah, I think it was one of one of those first ones. So it was, uh, and then after that, I was I just got hooked, and I, I I'm pretty sure I watched every single person's speech in there, Doctor Doctor Zishana Rain, and yes. uh. Georgia Eid and all, all of those people. And I just kind of snowballed from there and started reading and reading and, um, and just got hooked on it. Um, and so then I started finally trying to implement that um, with some of my clients. It was very tough. Uh, I, I want to say I first started doing it around 20, 2015, 2016 with clients. Um, and it was really tough. Uh, because I was in California at the time, and uh, and even even though that was after the you know low carb rush, I guess you could say there was still a tremendous amount of hesitancy. Um, many people were really really lo looking at me weird when when I said, "Oh no, go ahead and eat some fat," and and was this skip the uh, at fifteen and sixteen? So cool. Is that what you said? 2015, 2016? Yeah, 2015, 2015. Keto, keto as the trend didn't really start to take off till about 2017 was when it began. Um, and it kind of uh, way last year, it's on its way out now in terms of like books and, and things like that. It's still going to have lots of products and things like that. But that's probably why now it's a little more embraced because keto has become an acceptable term in society. Of course, I would argue it's become a bastardized term in our society because you could just call it yeah. whatever you want, keto. Oh, it's keto. No, most of those things aren't. But um, yeah, 2015, 16, you probably did have a little bit of an uphill battle still. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the thing that was really cool was at, at that time I was working at a uh, at a gold gym and uh, and the the clients who were willing to adopt that diet started having tremendous success where they were losing 30, 40, 50 pounds in two months, three months, um, really fast. And not, not obviously, you know, I wasn't giving them amphetamines or anything like that. Um, nothing that I, I mean, I couldn't prescribe. I'm not a doctor. Um, so I was literally just telling them basically stop eating carbs, replace it with fat. Um, and, Eat, eat what makes you feel good. And, uh, and because I had such tremendous success, I started getting all of the other trainers, some of whom were, you know, veteran trainers for years and years asking me, Hey, your, your clients are having a lot of, a lot of success. What are, what are you doing? How are, how are you doing that? <laughs> um, and so, uh, many of them didn't really believe me when I told them, uh, but, yeah, that's, that's what got me started. And then I, the most impressive thing, I mean, the thing that got me started, obviously, was within that two months when I first started keto, it eliminated my seizures completely. Two months. Yeah. Uh, 50, 59 days, first time in my entire life uh, since sixth grade when the auras began that I had not had a single aura. Wow. And I didn't need to take any medic. I was off. I got myself off all 
the medications. I uh, didn't need medications after that ever since. It's eight years later now. I haven't taken single medication since. Um, and I haven't had a single aura in, in eight years. So That's amazing. Yeah, that was phenomenal because they became, uh, they got to a point where they were really debilitating, even, even without, you know, even though I only had the one grand mall, they were making me feel like an Alzheimer's patient. Uh, I would forget things. Yeah. I would not, I would start to uh, almost seem like I had a stroke. Like I would try to talk and not uh, nonsense words would come out. I couldn't yeah. function for a few minutes. Um, so it was scary considering, you know, here's somebody who thought he was always healthy and why would this be happening? Are you tired of playing the mask game? Me too. That's why I wanted to tell you about the Unmask. This is a breathable, completely breathable. It covers, you can't even see that it's breathable, but it's breathable. Whether you're going on a plane, having to go into a store and wearing this thing, playthemaskgame.com is how you can get this mask. They come in all kinds of colors and everything. In fact, right there, you can see right through it what it is, but when you're wearing it, it does not look like it's anything different, but <sighs> it's breathable, baby. Playthemaskgame.com. So Nate, I'm, I'm curious. Um, so when you made this connection that you had tapped into something pretty interesting, being a personal trainer, adding in the, the nutrition element that actually helped your clients, and then seeing all of your fellow trainers with a lot more experience going, hey, dude, what are you doing to get results with your clients? And then their disbelief. Did it kind of spring in your mind of, huh, maybe we need personal training uh, that incorporates this kind of nutrition science into it? Is there anything like that out there? That's what I'm working on. <laughs> um so yeah, my my actual goal is I'm working towards building my own gym, and I uh, I'm working with some friends to essentially make it a a one stop shop uh, where this gym will be personal training, nutrition. We're going to be working. Uh, we're going to be trying to partner with doctors, with uh, educators, with everything possible surrounding the health field. Uh, even even stuff that's kind of on the fringe, you know, some holistic uh, medicine type stuff well, look, so that we don't. Yeah, I was going to say, well, look, functional medicine is a thing. Like if you don't get to the root cause of all things, you could throw all the, the lifestyle things, all the diet things, all the supplements, whatever, at someone. If you don't get to the root cause of what's causing their issue, you can't really do anything with it. And some of the root causes, a therapist, a psychiatrist, psychologist, can get in their head and help deal with some of the mental stuff while they're making diet changes, while they're making, you know, uh, progress on their addictions and things like that. So I, I love the totality approach. I've, I've long said the doctor of the future isn't a doctor. It's not just a PCP anymore. PCP, okay, great. That's the kind of catch-all. But you need specialization in a variety of areas. And I love that you're incorporating it not within a medical setting, but within a gym kind of setting. I love this. And part of the reason for that is I've had some experience with that already with running, uh, running gyms in that way, small gyms. And, um, and it is amazing what you can do with, with the community. I mean, that's part of why I was working so many hours is that I, I work, I worked with my clients. I would see five, five to 10 people per hour for 16 to 19 hours a day wow. um, with maybe one hour break in there somewhere. Um, and, uh, but I would see them five days a week. So that was the big difference. That's what I can do that doctors can't do um, is they see their patients once, once every year, once every six months, maybe once every month at most, if you're lucky and they don't really get to see what's going on day to day. Whereas I now have this op opportunity to do tremendous research where I had all of these uh, clients keeping diligent journals of all of their workouts and of all of their food and seeing exactly what was happening so that every single time something crops up, I can say, ah, okay, that doesn't work for you. Let's, let's shift. Or, hey, you slept really well last night. What did we do differently? Um, and... 
and making those sorts of things and uh, being able to catalog those was was huge and it made me a much much better trainer along with uh, of course a lot of help from people like yourself and you know Dave Feldman and Sean Baker Jason Fung and all of those brilliant doctors uh, dietdoctor.com who have tons of tremendous research um, as, as well as people like Dr. Aaron Horshig uh, and other physical therapists the Squat University I don't know if you've heard of him but they're brilliant in in addressing um, in addressing kind of a more holistic lifting yeah style of, uh, of approach to physical therapy and what it, what it got me to realize especially as I was my my wife um, my, my wife is a huge influence here of course as well she she got me loving reading again because I, I she got me hooked on audiobooks and <laughs> one of one of the things that I do in all of my spare time now is I, I read scientific journals through yeah. audiobooks because they have those available and I couldn't help but notice every time I read through these each there's some brilliant research going on and each one is so myopically and narrowly focused they're not they're not collaborating so all I could think was well what happened if each of these people started to collaborate with all their different fields wouldn't they see a lot of similarities and maybe yeah. There's something more holistic that we can use to address all of these issues for people. Dude, I print out studies all the time. <laughs> and I say the same thing. I'm like, all right, this one's focused on diabetes. This one's focused on obesity. This one's focused on brain health. This one's And it's like, they're all speaking the same language. Why can't we get them all on kind of some kind of network where we can talk behind the scenes? And by the way, they're... I am on a list of people that talk behind the scenes of all the names you mentioned earlier and many more. Uh, and we do talk to each other. So there is kind of like behind the scenes stuff, but there's not like an official, Hey, this research team is working on this. And then, you know, it would be cool if mechanistic things could be discussed amongst the researchers. Hey, we found this, uh, like I think Ben Bickman is doing some amazing work with Alzheimer's disease discovered the way ketones work in the brain that I think could be applicable to other parts of the body and other diseases, but like, they're not talking to each other. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and, and that was the big thing. And that's actually to, I, I, sorry if I tend to get sidetracked here, but to, to bring us back to, to the mental, Look, mental health squirrel, and addiction. A squirrel, a squirrel. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Um, uh, so to bring us back to the mental health and addiction, that's what that's what got me thinking about that, and that's that's where I really started to. So in terms of my my own addiction, I fortunately was lucky enough that um, I learned the lessons of my peers, and I, I never got addicted to substances in any way. Uh, well, other than food, I, I was absolutely sugar addicted and carbohydrate addicted my whole life pretty much. Um, and that wasn't really until the last last few years that I finally started to conquer that. And that is, again, almost 100% thanks to my wife, because when uh, we, we started dating a, a little over two years ago, and when we first met, um, she, uh, I, I had her doing keto as well, and, and she reversed her prediabetes and lost 40 pounds and reversed her hypoglycemia um, and started dramatically improving her mental health. Mm -hmm. um, but on top of that, she, she knew, I, I told her that it had cured my seizure disorder. And so she told me, so then it is never worth it for us to cheat. We'll just never cheat again because I never want to see you have a seizure. Way to go. Because we want to Way to go, Erica. Way to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she was uh, the absolute best influence on me there. Um, and since then, you know, uh, I, I think we've maybe cheated once or twice. It's it's incredibly rare. And, and even then, we we don't like the food anymore. That, that was one thing that we noticed is, you know, we, we would have a thing once in a blue moon and just think our food's better. <laughs> I can cook a steak and, and put salt on it and it tastes 10 times better. 
It's funny you talk about this because I literally just today got an email from a lady. I get emails all the time of this nature, but she had an email and she said, so I just read Keto Clarity and are you telling me I can never, ever have a bite of cake again if I'm at a party? That seems so draconian. How dare you tell people not to have cake? And so my response back was, look, you can have whatever you want. But when you make better choices for yourself, you find that you really don't want the cake anymore. What you want is foods that nourish your body and make you feel good. Now, here's the thing. You want the cake? Have the cake. But then pay attention to how you feel and just know it's going to knock you out of ketosis. You're not going to feel great. And if it's worth it to you, then go for it. Like, it's so funny. People kind of set this up as, I'll never have X again. Fill in the blank, whatever their favorite carb is. And I'm like, no, mm -hmm. you can have it. But you just have to know there are consequences that if you choose to have that, that you have to, you, you just have to endure. And if people are willing to endure and they rebuild their insulin sensitivity and they can handle it every once in a while, that's cool. But the problem is for some people, that once in a while then becomes, oh crap, I can't stop now because the addiction comes back. Then they start having the brain fog again. Then they start having mood issues again and they wonder what happened and they blame it on keto. Oh, that keto didn't work. I still, I just still felt bad. Well, no, the cheat didn't work. <laughs> so good for mm -hmm. you and, and uh, understanding that you probably know your limitations. Well, and that was, that was the biggest sign to me is that the, the more times uh, that I would have long periods of doing well diet wise and then would have a, a cheat, the more dramatic I noticed a difference. There were, there were times where, um, you know, I went, uh, and this, this was before I met my wife. So I was still kind of, I, I was keto, but I, I was still kind of in the bodybuilding mode. So, you know, I tried to strategically use my, my cheat meals. Um, on, on the, the weekends to try to, I don't know, stimulate more muscle growth. Didn't work. Uh, but, uh, so I, I would do that. And for an entire week after just a single, you know, one hour meal of some donuts and a pizza or something, um, not only would I gain eight to 10 pounds the very next day, um, in one fell swoop that took at least a week to come back off. Um, but my, moods and uh my my mental clarity everything was so dramatically reduced you know i would ha i would be very irritable for at least the first couple of days and i would just be uh depressed and unsure of myself and it would be like i was back in that state of yes. before i had felt it yes and uh, from and that look the changes you make are a lifestyle change. Like you, I know we say that it's kind of become a colloquialism. I remember when I first lost weight in 2004 and I started blogging in 2005, it's not just a diet, it's a lifestyle. You know, I would say that, but it's like, it, it's true. Like once you make that change, if you don't embrace it as that's the way it is now, then it's easy to slip back in. And so I, I love that you're doing that and that you make it a habit and you have a purpose in mind with making that habit stick. You've got epilepsy you're controlling. You've got these mental health issues that uh, are, are under control. So tell us some of, the, uh, some of the clients you've had, like some of the changes that you've seen in them, how they dealt with things and then were able to overcome them um, through nutrition changes. Oh man, I have seen some pretty, pretty amazing and unbelievable things. Um, reversal of type two diabetes, a reversal of, you know, all, all the, all the different forms of diabetes aside from type one that, that has yet to be done yet. But, uh, but I have seen dramatic improvements with a lot of type. I've, I've met a surprising number of type one diabetics and I've seen dramatic improvements with their control of their blood sugars, some of whom are almost considered non-diabetic they've got a1c's of 4.8 5.0 yes um and almost perfectly controlled blood sugars and uh i mean obviously the pancreas isn't producing any beta cells anymore so they still have to be on insulin but uh they take four units maybe eight units a day whereas prior to that they had to take 
30, 50, yes. something ridiculous. Um, so I've seen all sorts of physiological changes like that. I've seen women with PCOS who were told uh, in their 30s and even in their 40s who were told they would never have a child no matter what. All of them had children last year. Yes. Um, after, uh, yeah, and, and healthy children. Um, and, uh, and I've seen the, the best thing was having that community aspect, um, because that allowed me to have a space for a huge diversity of people. I've trained people as young as eight years old and as old as 92, um, and everything in between from all different cultures, all different backgrounds. Uh, and it's amazing when everyone is grouped in, in that, that shared misery of, of the <laughs> challenging workouts and trying to resolve their diet issues, how much people will connect from all walks of life. Yeah. Uh, and that was the most incredible transformation that I think I saw is all of these people just uh, who some, some were liberal, some were conservative, some were this, some were that. And it didn't matter because everyone was there to uh, get healthy, re re either lose weight or reverse some kind of uh, issue that they had. Um, and more importantly, they wanted most of them, because I, tra I train a lot of uh, parents, uh, so most of them just wanted to be there for their kids and their grandkids. Uh, so resolving the, the mental health issues there, uh, I mean, obviously not everyone got complete resolution, right. but, um, but there were some people who I've trained who were not in a good place when they started and to, to see them now, and I, I've kept in touch for years with a lot of these people and, um, to see where they are now based on where they started, basically almost not functional in society, some of them, and now they're having relationships and they are, uh, they're going on adventures and vacations and uh, it's, it's, it's a really rewarding and amazing thing to see. Keto Chow is a customizable shake mix that is also perfect for cooking and baking, giving you simple, nutritionally perfect meal options. Keto Chow. Make keto easy. Discover your favorite flavor at JimmyLovesKetoChow.com. Yeah, there's nothing better than a changed life. Especially when that changed life thought that their path to disease and obesity was forever. Because look, mainstream medicine makes it look like we can't do nothing for you. Therefore, you're just going to have to deal with it. Here's a pill to help soothe your woes. And I don't think we were meant to have pills. I don't think forever. Uh, you know, maybe for a period of time, maybe that can be helpful, but it's just odd that people can't see lifestyle and nutrition kind of being a pathway out of that kind of mainstream health management. I don't even want to call it health care. They're not, they're not even caring for you at that point. They're just kind of managing symptoms and not really doing anything to get to the root cause, which is why I love your idea about having this gym that has a doctor, has a psychiatrist, has a you know, all kinds of massage therapy, all kinds of things that can, uh, someone can deal with trauma. Like there's so many things that could be beneficial to the patient if they just had the help that they really needed. Yeah. Um, and that's, that, that is my end goal. I, it's, I, I can tell you where, where I stand now, I am the healthiest, happiest, most grateful I've ever been in my life. I have a wonderful marriage with my wife and, um, and I'm just so lucky and blessed to, to have all of these things now. And, and it only, it, the most amazing thing, and I, I know you just recently interviewed uh, Brett Lloyd, uh, who's brilliant. I'm, I'm a member of the Rivero Health that, that he coaches on, uh, Meet, Meet RX group. Um, and so I, I do those meetings daily and he has been a huge help to me specifically. Uh, but just the the fact that it can continue to get even better, even when you think this is this is my peak, this is the best I feel. 
and then the next day it gets even better. <laughs> and Look, it's incredible. I don't care where you are in your health and, and mental, physical, emotional, all health, you can always be better. And it's why I'm challenging myself starting September 1. It's why people are always wanting to be better. You just have to push yourself to be better. You can't sit on the sidelines and just expect it to come to you. You have to go to it to make it happen. And that was actually, that was one of my biggest challenges as a trainer for a long time, partly because I, I was lucky that I never struggled with being overweight or with having what appeared to be on the surface health issues, even though I had significant other health issues because people saw me and just assumed, Oh, well, he's one of those guys who's always been fit his whole life. He never really had to do this or that or diet or do whatever in order to look that way. And, um, the, the one, the one big thing that I try to always tell my clients is, um, there is absolutely nothing special about what I, uh, have done for myself. It should not be uncommon. It should not be something that, oh, just those fit people on the internet who post videos of their abs or whatever, that only, only they can do that. And they, they use all their, uh, you know, Photoshop and all that to make their abs look better. Only, only that, only it's, it's only accomplishable if you're, you're on steroids and this and that. And I'm not, I, I don't, don't take any steroids at all. And what I always tell my clients is that there's nothing special about what I achieved. The only difference between where I am in terms of physique or health or whatever it is and where other people are, where they're still struggling is that I have had more time being consistent. That's it. Uh, yeah. If other people started when they were 15 and started learning about stuff when they were, but you know, was lucky, lucky enough like myself to start learning about these things when they were 19, 20, 21, and then had, 10 more years of being consistent with it. Everybody has every reason to look as good, if not much better than I do. <laughs> and your journey is your journey and everyone else's journey is their journey. Like I think sometimes we put this idealistic thing, like people say, Jimmy, when are you going to get a six pack? I'm like, never. <laughs> Cause it's not my goal. I don't, I'm not really interested in it. If it happened, okay, but and, and I would put in a lot of effort, but I'm not going to beat myself up to try to get a six pack when that may never happen for me. And I'm okay with that. It's like, I think sometimes people put their expectations on things because they see others attaining these goals and they're like, well, I'll get a six pack. Well, maybe a six pack isn't in your future, but maybe living till you're a hundred is if you eat well if you take yeah. care of yourself well. And so that that's what I try to get people to focus on is stop looking at other people's goals and how they've changed and you change to become your best self. And that's, that's actually another thing that, um, that, that I think is, is really important to mention because I've, I've trained bodybuilders and I was a bodybuilder myself. And as someone who had a six pack for a long time, Six pack doesn't save you from from a slip disc and severe foraminal stenosis like I have. <laughs> so that was where people like uh, Dr. Aaron Horshig and and his book uh, Rebuilding Milo, um, he's a the physical therapist, were tremendously helpful. And he said, stop stop worrying about your stupid six pack. Start protecting your back. Yes, and incorporate you know these McGill McGill Big Three movements and various other back training and ab stability training techniques and now despite the fact that i technically still do have both the slip disc and severe foraminal stenosis i have zero pain i can lift as much as i want whenever i want and i have no issues uh, and that's not because of a six-pack <laughs> that is because i developed the stability by listening to people who are a lot smarter than myself <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. And you, your story is amazing. I love that you came on and talked about this subject of addiction and mental health and the things that you've seen in yourself and in your clients. Guys, again, Nate Clipfell is his name. Fellowship of the Nate over on Instagram. Go check him out. And uh, yeah, you are very booty, booty obsessed. Uh, certified <laughs> personal trainer. Where, where are you located? Are you still in L.A.? No. Oh, sorry. I, I live in uh, Henderson, Nevada now. So I'm out, out in Nevada. Yeah. Um, right, right near uh, Vegas. 
So I did, okay, near Vegas. Okay. I didn't see a website or anything other than your Facebook page, any way to find you? Uh, I do not have a website yet. Um, I, I have my, my Instagram, my Facebook. I just got on TikTok recently and then, uh, and then just my email. When you open that gym that you described earlier, I want you to put the URL in your Instagram because I want people to, and I'll probably fly out just to come see your gym because that's a cool call to wait. And I, I think that's, that's really good. In fact, I'll come and do a whole like story on you once you get it going. So how's that for motivations? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Get inspiration from the Living La Vida Low Carb Show. Hey, the Living Low Carb Show dot com. Woo. Have you experienced the dreaded keto flu? Did you know that most of these symptoms are actually due to your body dumping excess electrolytes? This is where Element comes in. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt with no sugar. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs and is perfectly suited to folks following a keto, low carb, or paleo diet. Element contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio, 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. With none of the junk, no sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, no BS. Everyone needs electrolytes, especially those on low-carb diets, or if you practice intermittent or extended fasting, if you're physically active or sweat a lot, Add Element today and see how much better you feel and perform. Use the URL drinklmnt.com slash Jimmy.